Welcome. How's everybody this morning? Hopefully you're awake. Hopefully you've been chewing on God's Word, and you'll know why I'm saying that, hopefully, as we approach the Scriptures today. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, for helping out and filling in. Um, one of the great things with God's people and God's family is when you call upon someone and you ask them to help join in, uh, they say yes and how much and how long and I'm ready for it. That's an amazing thing with God's family, is it not? That the world sees us unified is so important. So how many of you like to eat steak? A few. A few, a few meat haters out there? All right. Well, our favorite steak sometimes is one that is marinated just right, one that is seasoned just right, one that is rubbed just right, and then one is, that is cooked just right. Is that important, Gene? Very important. Why is it important? Because who likes a, ta- a steak that's tough and tastes bad, right? Does anybody love uh, Gene's steak? I'm drawing attention to him. So think about Gene's steak as we look at God's Word today. When a, when a steak is unwrapped, and I was going to bring one, but I didn't know how to keep it cold, think about the butcher paper that's around it, right? You have the butcher paper around it. it it's a primo steak. You know, you might only have that once or twice a year if you're like me, or once every three years if you're in my pay range. So you, you put a nice little tie around it. You have the string around it, and you're, and you're so anticipating taking that home and getting that steak ready for the grill, Right? And as you cut the string and open up the butcher paper, the anticipation builds. And we get ready for it. And as it's perfectly cooked, not too rare, not too well done, just perfectly cooked, and you slice off a little bit and you put that first taste in your mouth and hopefully every taste, don't you just like to savor that? Is anybody drooling besides me? Okay, as we savor that, we chew on it. And meat is a little bit different than other things. Meat takes a while to digest, so it needs a lot of chewing. So we chew on it, we chew on it, we get the taste, we get the understanding of it, and then we swallow it, and it takes a while to digest. Well, keep that picture in your mind as we go through 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 7 today. Keep that in your mind. We're going to unwrap this butcher paper. We're going to cut the strings around the package, and we're going to look a little bit back in our background here today to get the context or the texture, if you want to stay with meat, to Paul and Timothy's ministry. We are at approximately 63 to 64 AD in time. Paul has been Um, in Timothy's ministry. Timothy has been in his ministry. Paul has just recently been released from prison. And we see that he's off here in Macedonia. Well, we say those words and we think, well, that must be some weird ancient country. But the modern country is uh, northern uh, Macedonia today. It is also called northern Greece on the south end. And it's also called southern Serbia on the uh, north end. So get a little mindset of where this is. That's Macedonia of the ancient days. And then Ephesus, we look over towards Turkey, and on the western shore of Turkey, in in a little town now that's just outside of where Ephesus used to be, is Selchuk. In Selchuk, it's a town of about 36,000 now, but at that time period that we're talking about, this was a center of commerce. This was a center of things coming in, a port town going uh, throughout Antioch and other areas. So very important town that we see Timothy in. We also have to look at that he is dealing with certain men who were teaching false doctrines and were causing controversies and divisions within the church. Is that going on today? So these things have carried forward, right? So these warnings that we're going to go over and and these qualifications that we're going to go over, are they just as vital today as they were 2,000 years ago? Absolutely. Absolutely. They're so important for the foundation of the church. Have you ever thought about the foundation of the church and why we're here? How well established had the foundations of Timothy and Titus and Paul's churches How solid had they had to been to have a foundation that is carried to us, Bobby, carried to us 2,000 years later? What an amazing foundation that has been laid. 
So let's look at that. Look back at the beginning of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. And we're going to again look at the texture. We're going to look at the context of where we're at. 1 Timothy 1, 3. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge or command certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. We also get a great glimpse of this sizzling steak that we're starting to, to cut and starting to chew on by getting a deeper bite at the context and texture by looking at the narrative in Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 35. Listen carefully. Starting at verse 28, Acts 20. Pay careful attention. Now, this is Paul speaking to those that are about to get established. And they are going from Miletus to Ephesus to Crete. So he's telling them a foretelling of what is about to happen. And he says to them, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, be alert. Therefore, be alert. Don't forget about that term. Therefore, be alert. Remembering that for three years, I did not cease day or night to admonish everyone in tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance amongst all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver. I coveted no one's gold, no one's apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Those words still ring true today. Those warnings from Miletus going forward into Ephesus as Paul is heading off to Macedonia, those words are still so important today. Be alert be aware. No doctrine. No God's word. Chew on God's word so that you know it and you understand it. Paul is writing this letter to Timothy and the church. He is outlining critical criteria for determining whether a man was qualified to be a spiritual leader in the church. And we have to ask ourselves, we must take a well-seasoned bite and chew on these truths. Why was this so important and so critical to write down? Why? Let's look. We must rem remember that Paul had left Timothy in Ephesus. And he's handling this leadership crisis that is growing there. What Paul had warned about, like we just said in Miletus, in Acts 20, had happened just as he said it would. So he wasn't a false prophet. Paul said, this will happen. How many times do we read in Scripture where it says, this will happen, and we're like, oh, I don't know if it's going to happen. This will happen, I'm not sure. Jesus makes promises. God makes promises. The covenant with man is made, and we say, oh, I'm not sure if that's going to be carried out. It will be carried out. You can trust Revelation that he's coming again. So he goes on to encourage and further instruct Timothy. And I'm sure the other leaders around Timothy. I don't think this letter was just written for Timothy's eyes. I'm sure that Timothy was showing it to the other leaders. And it was giving him a little bit of credence, correct? Because this, this letter is directly from Paul. So he has credence amongst the other leaders of where these ideas and where these statements are coming from. Because remember, Timothy is still a young man. And some probably didn't respect him because of his age. But Paul writes this letter with these qualifications in chapters 3, verses 1 through 13. Well, we're going to go over verses 1 through 7, Lord willing. And let's pray about this before we get started. Father God, I thank you for this day. 
I thank you for all those that have said, use me. I thank you for everyone that is here today. Lord, I pray that you would take away all distractions right now from our mind, from our heart, from our eyes, that we could look at your word and we could understand that your Holy Spirit would be teaching us right now what we need to glean from your word today. We need your power. We abide in you and ask your love and mercy in Jesus' name. Amen. In these verses, we will be trying to define some terms that we see right here at the beginning. One of those terms is going to be overseer or bishop. And the Greek word episkopos and also this word elder, that we see this uh, Greek word again. I'm not a Greek scholar, but looking up these things, it's very interesting when you see episkopos. What does that sound like? Episcopalian, right? So people grab these things and they actually named their churches after them. And then we see elder or elder-led, presbyteros. And we look at that and Paul is using these terms referring basically to the same position. He's, sh he's showing us that shepherd and pastor and elder are all one and the same. And that's what we have to understand and get our heads around. And I think that God's going to show us that today. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, we see Paul using the term elder, speaking about these same persons. Remember that these qualities and these descriptions should be the goal of every one of us. Every single one of us should be saying, what are these goals and qualities of leaders? And is that true in my own life? And I'm telling you, I looked at them for the last three months, and it's overwhelming. I don't know if any other leaders can attest to this. It's overwhelming when you look at these qualities that God has put before us. It's humbling. And it's very easy to say, man, Lord, I don't measure up. Father, help me. And that's why I wanted Jeremy to read in um, John 15, how important is it to abide in Christ? Super important. If you take a grafted branch, does anybody understand grafting? We have a grafted branch into a tree, say an apple tree. How long does that grafted branch last when you remove it from the graft point? It has to be perfectly in there. It has to be perfectly lined up. It has to be perfectly wrapped. It has to be protected from not blowing out of the grafting point. Very important, right? So we see that this is important. This is so important that we need to remember that these qualities and descriptions are our goal, our aspirations. And they should not be just for every Christian man and every Christian woman to be good, but to aim towards these goals. It's a good thing. And we are allowed to do that through sanctification. It's a big word. We're justified by the cross. We're justified by Christ's blood. But we're then sanctified by what? The teaching of God's word, the reading of God's word, the, the changing, that the transformation that that causes as we chew on it. And it causes us to have the proteins in our body that we need. How long does your body last without protein? I can tell you in January, watching my mother-in-law shrivel and shrivel and shrivel, without protein, she was going to die. And we tried everything we took good to increase her, her caloric level to get her above 71 pounds. But without protein, it wasn't going to happen. So as protein started pouring in, her body started to become healthy. And we look at ourselves and we say, without the protein of God's word, without the chewing of God's word, without the digestion of God's word, we will shrivel and die. And this abiding stops. And we need it not to stop. It should never be stagnant. And it should never plateau. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-7, through 7, if you turn there, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-7, through 7, Paul outlines here a structure of maturity, and a structure of qualifications in 15 points. And we're not going to be able to unwrap each and every one of those 15 points because it would take us hours. And we don't have that long. But we're going to look at each one of these points. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would allow them to absorb into you and be chewed on by you. And then when you go home, you would look at the bigger picture. And the bigger picture of these 7 or 13 verses is to look at all of 1 Timothy, all of 2 Timothy, and all of Titus. 
So when you go home this week, look through First and Second Timothy, chew on it, read it, and Titus, and see how these will speak to you. Paul starts out in verse 1 with a trustworthy statement. This, this saying or thus saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Well, let's chew on that a little bit. If one aspires to an office of an overseer, that person has to check their heart. Why do they want to be in that office of an overseer? Are they being called by the church? Does the church just automatically see that in their life and the church is calling them? Or is it a desire that they want to be in power? It is a desire that they want to be respected for who they are. Always have to keep that in check. And sometimes that can be a daily occurrence where you have to check yourself and find out what is the reason behind the desire and the aspirations to be an overseer. But it's not a bad aspiration unless it's with the wrong intent. He also says this is a noble task. We can say, well, I like that word noble. See, if, if I'm doing something noble, somebody's going to see me. Somebody's going to say, hey, how about that guy? How about that girl? Wow, they're doing something noble. Well, noble should be humble. Noble should be serving. Noble should be a task. Oh, wait a minute. He says it's a task. He says it's going to be some work. There's going to be putting the hands to the plow. And we know if we put our hands to the plow, what if we look back? What does God's word say? We're not fit for the kingdom of God. So he said, be very, very careful about this aspiration. Be very, very careful about this desire. Because once you put the hand at a plow, don't look back. Count the costs. And there are costs. It may cost you everything. Let's go to the second, or the, actually the first point to chew on. Verse 2. Chapter 3, verse 2. Above reproach. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. Man, that's a hard one to chew on. I chewed on that in tears, looking at that and like, above reproach. Is, is my total life inside the church and outside the church and in my family, behind closed doors, above reproach? Wow. That above reproach, we can think about it, a person of good reputation inside and outside the church, a trustworthy person, a person with integrity, a person that is thought of and spoken well of by those in the church. But is reputation all it's called out to be? Does anybody know somebody, maybe their whole life they were spent, they had great reputation, and then you found out that their character stunk? That behind the scenes it was all a lie? That it was a falsehood? Well, I want to read you a quote from John Wooden. Um, in, a, in a book that John read, or wrote, I'm sorry, he wrote a warning, and I thought it fit this very well. John Wooden was a famous coach, a very successful coach, and he wrote, Be more concerned with your character than your reputation. Character is what you really are. Reputation is what people say you are. Reputation is often based on character, but not always. Wooden's message is that character precedes reputation. Character is like the solid foundation and framework of a house that is built to last. The reputation is just the finished product that people see from the street. Just like the facade of a house in a Hollywood movie set, people can have a reputation that looks beautiful on the outside. The people say, wow, wow, that person, that girl, that gal, that guy are amazing. Wow. But when they walk through the door and you look at what's really there behind the scenes, it's a facade. It's a movie set. We have to be careful and we have to watch that very carefully, that that is the point. And as we look at these points and we ponder upon these points, these bites, if you will, as we chew on these bites, I think that these qualifications are going to show you that there's checking behind closed doors in them. Second bite. The husband of one wife, speaking of one's moral purity, 
a man of one woman, if you will. Amazingly, it's the top of the list here. At the top of the list of Timothy and the top of the list of Titus is this, if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife. Now, does that negate for leadership somebody that's never been married? No. How about pre-Christ? You've gone through a terrible divorce pre-Christ. Doesn't negate. But we have to ask ourselves, in our mindset, in our culture, in this culture that we're talking about, this looking back in that culture, what was going on in that culture with the Israelites, with the Jews? They were giving certificates of divorce, and, and he says, no, that shouldn't be. He says, be a man, a mindset of one woman. Be sold out. If you're with a woman right now, be sold out for her in Christ. You can't change the past. There's persons here that I love dearly, that things like this are hard to hear. Are they not? They are. And it's like, oh no, that disqualifies me? Not in Christ. But as leadership of the church, these things have to be checked. They have to be watched. They have to be looked over. They're super important to the foundation of the church. And what was going on here, was there polygamy going on in this time period? Yes. Was there uh, easy divorce going on? We can see that through Jesus, right? They tried to test him. What about what Moses said? Moses said we could have a certificate of divorce. He goes, before Moses... There was one man, one woman. The reason he told you that is because you're hardened of heart. You're wrong. You're wrong. And it's hard to hear that we're wrong, is it not? It is. It's very hard to hear that we're wrong in our culture. And the culture bristles. And you may be bristling now and saying, how could Brian bring that up today? That hurt. I didn't bring it up to hurt. I bring it up in love. I bring it up because Jesus brings it up. That's the amazing thing about walking through God's Word. You can't avoid any subject, hard or easy. Sometimes things are just a, a shot of glucose, right? And our blood sugar goes up. That's some of the Psalms for me. But sometimes it's a steak and you got to chew it and you got to think about it and you got to digest it. And with a cow, what does a cow do? They don't eat steak, but they have to bring things back up and they ruminate on it. And sometimes we need to bring things back up and ruminate on what God's word says. Chewing bite number three, self-controlled. A person who is balanced in words and balanced in his actions. The definition of self-controlled is in 1 Thessalonians 5. He tells us to be alert. Didn't we just read that? We just read that in Acts 20. Be alert. So a man who is alert, a woman who is alert, of the light, people of the day, a steadiness of character, self-controlled. Very important. Chewing point number four. Sober-minded or sensible, which really means wise and humble. A good example of this is in Romans 12, verse 3. Romans 12, verse 3. Listen. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. He is saying here to think humbly. Think with a sound mind. Being alert. And he's going to get into that a little bit more very soon. Chewing point number five. Respectable. A life that is attractive to the gospel. A life that represents the gospel of Jesus Christ. A modest life. A humble life. One that is not a distraction. Our life should not be a distraction from the gospel. Our lives should be something that wets the appetite, that salts the appetite of the world, that salts them to be thirsty, so that when they are thirsty, where do they go to? The water of life, Christ. When they're hungry, where do they go to? Christ, the bread of life. Do we see that our lives are important? 
In law enforcement, when we were building a case, and I'm not sure if Fred's here or not, but Fred has to build a case, right, Fred? You have to go and you have to build your witness base. Very tough for a public defender or a person on the defense side sometimes when their client is guilty, very, very tough to get witnesses usually that are credible. So what each side tries to do is build a base of credibility, credible witnesses. That's what he's calling us to be, respectable, credible witnesses to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our credibility means something. If we're lying all the time, if we're stealing all the time, if we're angry and bitter and punching people out, and we're, we're pugilist and we're, we're ready to, oh man, don't tick me off, man, because you slap me, I'll slap you harder. You come at me, I'll come at you harder. You cut me off, I'll, I'll chase you down and run into your car. Is that a good reputation? Is that a good credible witness for the life of Jesus Christ? No, it's not. And those things we have to put off as the old man, putting on these new things of Jesus Christ. Chewing, bite number six. To be hospitable, which refers to being unselfish and generous with all that we own and all that we have. An openness and a fondness for strangers. An openness to have our doors open and ready to take somebody in at a moment's notice. To some, that is a gift, correct? There's some in this church I know that have that gift. It's like, doesn't matter who it is. I'll be a little careful. Not going to bring somebody in that's ready to kill, rape, and murder my family. But if if they're in need and I see that need, I'm going to meet that and my door is going to be open. That's, That's a gift. Some of us have to work at it. That's okay. Some of us see hospital and we have to say... You know what? That's a character trait that's not normally in me. My old man is not very hospitable. So as I put off the old man and I put on the new man, I have to practice. Is that correct? How many times do we have to practice something to get good at it? I'll be honest with you. When I was in the military, I wasn't a very good shot. I was scared to death. The first time I shot a 45 and it went off, it scared the daylights out of me. It almost blew out of my hand. I had, a, I had a hold of it too hard. Then the guy said, you're holding it too hard. You're shaking. Then I tried to hold it too light. And it almost flew out of my hand. And this big explosion happened. But as I became trained and practiced round after round after round, within six weeks, I was shooting right in the dead center of the target. It took practice. It takes practice sometimes at these things that we're not good at. And if you're not good at hospitality, practice it. Start putting it into action. Chewing point number seven, able to teach. That doesn't always mean preaching in the pulpit. A lot of times people say, well, if an elder's called, they should be able to preach from the pulpit. That's not always true. Because really all preachers are teachers, but not all teachers are preachers. We can look at that and we can say, well, I know men in this church that are very godly and can look at the scripture, read it with people and understand it and open it and explain it in a Holy Spirit manner that probably wouldn't be able to do standing up in front of the whole group. And I've seen them in action with one person, two person, ten persons, and they do very well, and they teach very well. So an an ability to teach. In context or in texture, we can read this further in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 23 through 26. 2 Timothy chapter 2, 23 through 26. Listen carefully have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth." And they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. True character behind what we are saying is more important than anything clever or eloquent we could ever say. Don't miss that. Our true character behind what we are saying is so much more important. If I had poor character... There would be people here right now, and I hope maybe some of you are saying, I don't know about his character. I've never met the guy. I don't really know him that well. Please come and know me. 
I want to know you. Get together. Let's talk. Get to know one another's character. What's behind the scenes. But if the character isn't built, does the message mean anything? If you knew that I was up here and that I was a liar and a scammer and a shammer and, and you read about, man, this, this guy was a deputy and man, he did anything he could to get by and he lied and he planted you know, evidence on people and, and he testified and he did all these things. Fred right now would be going, I don't trust the guy. I don't trust him. How can I listen to what he's saying because I've seen his life out in the public and it doesn't match up to what's blabbing out of his mouth on a Sunday morning. Our character means something. The character of men bring the message because it's Jesus Christ working in them. Not in that man's perfection, but in God's perfection. Because we're always being sanctified, moving forward. We have never arrived. Chewing point number eight. Not a drunkard or not an excessive drinker. That really falls to being not addicted to anything. Any substance that would make us not alert. Any substance that would take our eyes off of Christ. I've heard many men over the years say, you know what, I just, I just like to throw back a few and let my inhibitions go. Is that a good thing? Letting my inhibitions go? I just want to relax and just not think about life. Is that good? Not according to the warning that we just heard in Acts 20. He says, be alert. How can I be alert if I'm imbibed? How can I be alert if I'm smashed? How can I practice hospitality and love and kindness and gentleness if, if I'm taking myself to a level of drunkenness or foolishness that destroys my testimony? And more than that, for Christ's sake. See, we die to ourselves and our lustful, passionate desires for Christ's sake. It's not about us. It's about Jesus Christ. We're his representative. We're his ambassador. We're his reflection like the moon of the sun. We're the reflection of Christ. If we're drunk and smashed and imbibed, how are we being a reflection of anything but that of the world? It's impossible. And God calls it a sin. God calls drunkenness a sin. Do you know that? It's a, it's a pretty serious thing because it allows us to be controlled by self. It allows us to be controlled by pride. It allows us to be controlled by lust. It allows us to be controlled by the enemy and not being alert. Chewing point number nine. Not violent. Not a bully. Not a person ready for a fight. In some versions it reads, not a striker. Or not pugnacious. That's a big word. Pugnacious. Have you ever heard of the word pugilist? When I was younger, I was a boxer. I was a pugilist in the boxing against other men. We're not called to be that with one another. We're not called to be that with the world. We're not to be ready for a fight. Tick me off, I'll knock you out. That was the old man. Crossing my path, look at me wrong. You're going to have a bloody lip. That was the old man. It was wrong and it was evil and it was not of Christ. If that is your spirit, pray. If that is your spirit, get in the word. If that is what you're struggling with, go to God with it. Confess it to other men. That's very helpful. Confess it to other men so that they can help you. They can hold you accountable. And what I find a lot of times, men and women here, when you confess to somebody, it's amazing where all of a sudden their eyes drop and they go, I struggle with that too, but I didn't know if I could tell anybody. I thought everybody in Genesee Country Church was perfect. Is there any perfect person here? There's not a perfect soul in here. But we serve a perfect Savior. We serve a Messiah who is awesome and powerful. We really do. We should be gentle. Not a verbal abuser. Not a striker. Self-controlled in our speech and our attitude. Gentle and sensitive, loving and kind, quick to repent, quick to seek God's restoration with others and ourselves with God. Chewing point number 11, not quarrelsome, not divisive, not argumentative. 
We should not be trying to divide the church. We should not be gossipers. We should not be going, hey, you know what? Oh, Brian just gave that sermon. Man, you won't believe what I found out about him today. Oh my goodness, I went and searched and I found this out and boy, I want to expose this. Is that good? Is that helpful? Is that divisive? Yeah. If it's not something that's currently ongoing and you see that, find that, search that, good. Come to me and say, Brian, this is what I see. This is what I've heard. This is what I might even know. Let's check that with God's word together and let's see where we can grow in that. That's the heart. That's the spirit that we have to have for unity. Not quarrelsome, not divisive, not argumentative. 12, not a lover of money, not greedy, not materialistic. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul further states, chapter 6, verse 10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. How many times have you heard that money is the root of all evil? How many times have you heard that? I've heard that a thousand times in my lifetime. Money is the root of all evil. If I was to lay here a $100 bill, is that evil? Is that something that can do anything on its own? How about a knife? If I lay a knife there, is that knife able to do anything? It's an inanimate object. In the hands of a chef, it's wonderful. Cutting your steak, it's beautiful. Using it to murder, using it to cut someone, terrible. See, money can be used for God's glory in wonderful ways. It is amazing what can happen with the generosity of those who have been provided things of this world but provided to build up God's kingdom, God's glory, helping others that have not, teaching others that have not. Very important. It's the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through the craving of the love of money, the craving of wanting to have more, that many have wandered, he says, away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. The lusting after money, the coveting of what other people have, destroys men and women. Destroys them. And it definitely destroys leaders. If you're coveting what somebody else has have, and you're envious and you're jealous, you should not be in leadership. You should not be in leadership. And that's what he's saying here. It's a dangerous thing. 13. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive, for if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Managing competently. Managing as a good father. Managing as a good husband. That fruit, remember you can say anything here at church. But what shows you and exposes you more than anything? Your children. And some children have, you know, they're growing up, they're, they're a little rebellious. This, this is a constant attitude of rebellion and non-respect for fathers. If that's true, that's probably not the person you want in charge of the church. Because if there is just total outward rebellion in the home, fighting, angry, and it's caused by the father, would you say, man, but on Sunday that guy's got it together. On Sunday that guy can preach. On Sunday that guy can teach. On Sunday that guy... But if he can't do all the things that he's supposed to do in his household, why would you want him in charge of all of you? If a man is a bad manager of money, do you want him in, as the treasurer of the church? If a man's been caught in theft numerous three, four, five times in his lifetime, and you say, well, we'll just, we're going we're gonna to excuse that, but we're going to allow him now to manage everything that the church brings together, what do you think is going to happen? Is that wise? It's not wise. See, many of these things, these character qualities are just based on wisdom. God's wisdom. God's handed down wisdom to Paul. Paul is stating to Timothy and the others that if a man can't or doesn't manage his own household well, he will not be able to manage the flock and the body. 14. Not a recent or new convert, a seasoned believer. As I like to say, a tested oak. My grandfather used to say that tree out in the middle of that field is way stronger than the tree that's in the middle of the forest. That's true. Why? Because that tree out in the middle of the field has been checked by storm after storm after storm and that lumber is hard. 
rock solid hard if it's not eaten away by coons and everything else. But it's hard. It's been checked. You want someone who's a seasoned oak that's maybe had some rough times, maybe had some loss. Why is Dick and, and uh, Lynette Gilbert such good counselors? Why? Because they've had some loss. They've had some pain. They've faced adversity. And they stood up to it in God's Word. Not a new convert. Why not a new convert, we ask? Well, Paul tells us. Or he may be puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Chewing point 15, verse 7. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace or into the snare of the devil. Many times we hear, well, that guy's he's, he's wonderful on Sunday. You know, he, he does a great job. But man, I heard at work, he is a jerk. I've met him at his workplace. The guy is a total tool. I don't like to talk to him. He's arrogant. He's grumbly. He's complaining. If that is our workplace reputation and character, is that what you want to bring into the leadership of the church? No. And Paul says so. No. Check these things, leaders. Check these things, church. And as we're checking the leaders, we should be checking ourselves, right? Many of us, including me, in our current leadership, have said to many of these bites that we chewed upon today that we feel like we don't match up to these qualities. And we don't perfectly. We are all works in progress. We all must take these qualities seriously in the church and in all of our lives. These qualities in leadership and in our households are paramount. They bring us together in unity and they show the world that Christ reigns. Not only in our mouth, but in our lives. That Christ is worthy to be praised because our life reflects Christ. These qualities in leadership in all of our households bring us together in unity, abiding in Christ. That's why I had him read John 15. Abiding in Christ. In what Christ has done in what the Holy Spirit is doing. Thank you for reading John 15. Take that home with you. If you don't know this Jesus that we're speaking about, if you don't know Him, turn to Him. See and hear that you are a sinner facing judgment of a righteous God. A righteous judgment of of God Almighty. None of us are innocent. Not one of us is innocent. God's Word says all men have fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. The truth is this, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. That He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. That he appeared to Cephas, then he appeared to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at the same time, most of whom were still alive when that was being written. Then he appeared to James, then he appeared to all the apostles. If you are being drawn by that God, if you are being drawn by what he is revealing to you in the need of a Savior, please come to him. He stands before you with arms open wide. Come unto me. Come unto me and find your rest. Come unto me and know this salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Be set free and live for Him. I'm inviting you. I'm asking you. If this is on your heart and mind today, to walk away from what this life has lied to you about. To walk away from the sin that so easily besets you. To walk away from the life that you've been lied to about. And walk unto Christ. Is there anyone here today? All eyes open. All eyes open. All eyes looking around. Is there anyone today? 
that says, I want that Jesus. I need that Jesus. I need a Savior. I'm dying and I'm going to hell without a Savior who has paid for my sins. Is there anyone? Well, then I say with Paul, I am not guilty of your blood. Paul has given us a warning in the qualifications of the leaders. He is giving us a purpose in the qualities of the leaders. He is giving us a challenge in these qualities of the leaders. And he is also giving us a challenge of salvation. If you don't know this Jesus, come unto him. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this day, this hour, this minute that you saw at the beginning of the creation of the earth. As you spoke the universe into being, you saw that we would be here today. You know the hearts and the souls that are here today. You teach us, Father, that we are eternal. You teach us, Father, that we only have two destinations, heaven or hell. Father, I pray that if there's one here today, they do not hesitate. They do not wait. As they're chewing on the things that have been given them today, that you would draw them unto yourself and they would respond with faithfulness that you are God Almighty. Father, walk with us into this Sunday school hour. Help us to preach your word, teach your word, be your word. Father, I say humbly, help me. I say humbly, thank you for what you have done and what you are about to do. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Sunday school will start in about 10 minutes.